it's uh, so, so nice to welcome uh, Harmony and Russell today. They're such dear friends of mine and probably I'm the most excited just to have them both on for a myriad of reasons. One, they've, they've always been my mentors and I've always looked up to both of them. And I met Harmony in Mysore, India. I think it was on my first trip at the old Chakra House. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of a, uh, a really sweet experience. She, she's warm and welcoming to all. And uh, she was authorized. And um, he, at the time, um, now she's since been certified. And she, um, <clears throat> during that time since then, you know, she founded two yoga schools, had a a baby who's a little bit bigger than a baby size now <laughs> and uh, uh, has experience in Vipassana meditation um, and just such an honor and pleasure to have her on board as well as her husband Russell who um, I was first enamored with by his Karandavasana. I said oh I need to do it like that <laughs> um, but it was still hard to do Russell like that. <laughs> and uh, uh, what you may or may not know, Russell shares a similar boat as me in that uh, we both taught at a university setting for a little while. He was at Stanford University for some time, but he has a much more eclectic, diverse background in that he um, taught in other places for a little bit of, as well as in Taipei in Brighton, New York City, um, and some other places. So uh, most importantly, he's very humorous. So if he says something, um, just, you, you, it might be a joke. So just be fair warned. And, um, <laughs> and he's a very sharp and astute artist that um, I really have come to appreciate and love. And hopefully we'll get into some of that today. Um, all right, so thankful, thankful for both of you coming on. Yeah. having you here <clears throat> uh let's start uh first, the first time i saw you you were in my living room in new york <laughs> and i went i went downstairs and like who's this who's this cracker in my living room that's what i wanted to know you you were like the longest most laid-back person i'd ever seen <laughs> and i found out that we were both like we both spent time in slidell louisiana yeah like, Used to like roller 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 skate <laughs> skateboard. Yeah, skateboard. like you take a two by four, you take the roller skates off, and you put them on there. This is what it's I think. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you were you were doing that in Slidell. Yeah, there was a park called Pink Panther uh, Skate <laughs> Park that was like from the seventies that they had closed, and a guy used to chase us off with a shotgun. Right, <laughs> you been arrested down there. No, we didn't get arrested. It was the it was a private park, and the guy would come out there, and he'd say, "Get out of here!" and he'd start shooting his gun in the air. And then right. <laughs> that's a normal day. And yeah. We would go yeah. get Hundo pizzas from Taco Bell, and then go to the drive-through daiquiri place because you were sixteen, <laughs> and in Louisiana you could just get anything. Back. <laughs> These were different times, obviously. <laughs> 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 We were talking to a friend yesterday on um, on uh, Dr. Jag. He, Dr. Jag, he would he was he teaches uh, uh, race awareness. Yeah, seminars on seminars on racism. racism. And uh, we were talking about getting arrested, and I, and I mentioned to him how many times I've been arrested in Louisiana which you know that i'm still alive is is really white privilege in a nutshell you know yeah. <laughs> and so that you were you know skateboarding and doing all that stuff and being sh chased around with a shotgun is, is another example of, yeah well i mean i experienced firsthand um and now you're just making me think of this a much different si situation in atlanta skateboarding when i was yeah. living there and I, I got arrested with some black friends and they did not have a similar experience as me. It was really, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, really, you know, messed up. And I, I saw very firsthand how, how that situation was really a mess. 
yeah. uh, to speak. <clears throat> but we're going to get to that. Um, <laughs> uh, is there anything else? <laughs> yeah, fair warning for all of you guys that are on. It's lovely seeing all of you. You might want to get a coffee, and this one might take a little bit longer. Um, I'm I'm expecting already, um, but we'll try to stay on task. I I have literally three pages, and then I got even more in my head popping up this morning. So you sent um, me all these all these questions, John, and I looked at them and I said, this is like three days worth of questions. <laughs> I yeah. don't know what to do with these. Well, I like to have like lots of options <laughs> in case we <laughs> decide to go that way. Okay, uh, let's start actually, I'm gonna start differently um, because it's been on the forefront of everyone's mind um, since the US and, and other parts of the world are grappling with racist systems of power uh, after the murders of George Floyd and many, many, many others. Um, what yeah. is this mean for us as yoga practitioners going forward? What do you think is our best action in these times? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's yeah. a, <laughs> yeah, on the hot seat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I can only speak from like my own, experience of you know being a white woman not a black woman and being in Canada and not in America you know these are very different um, experiences but uh, you know my my feelings um, aren't really to to speak so much to um, you know the what's what's happening in the sense of I, I can't really you know express what it's like to be um, discriminated against in that in that way but um, I do think that it's our responsibility as yoga practitioners to get really uh, raw and real about all the ways that you know we ourselves have been oppressors I mean, and not just like to people of color, but like to other people just in general, because we all have that in us, you know, the, this tendency or this uh, urge to, um, you know, be, um, to control or to dominate. Yeah. And so I think we need to start looking at these aspects and qualities and tendencies uh, within ourselves and start to look at, you know, our fears and our hungers, what's driving us in many ways. Um, and also to be active in combating injustice and active in fighting for what's right. And what's right is that all humans have you know, basic um, respect that they are being treated uh, in, in a way that is supportive and not unjust. And anytime there's an injustice and anytime there's inequality, um, it's, and anytime, I mean, what's happened in throughout history in the United States and, and I mean worldwide let's let's be honest it happens here in Canada also even like especially with the indigenous um, population the native people you know there's a lot of really terrible things that have gone on here um, and in America as well <laughs> uh, you know and that this isn't this isn't a, a I guess, uh, an issue that's limited to the United States or limited to particular people in the United States, you know, those people, those racist people who are against black people, it's not limited to that scope and that we all have to do the work inside of ourselves to see what, what aspects of ourselves are contributing to this ongoing, um, deep inequality, deep um, injustice globally as well. And that, 
that we need to then start making actions um, in some way, even if it's just becoming aware of how we're contributing to the problem, uh, that's part of the solution. You know, that's part of healing, that's part of helping is to have this awareness that, that we're not um, absolved of responsibility and that uh, like Arjuna on the battlefield, you know, we have to fight the good fight against an unjust society, a corrupt society, a dharma. And that that's our duty as yoga practitioners, as people, especially who practice Ashtanga yoga, who are devoted to the eight limbs and the first yama being ahimsa, non-harming. And so non-harming isn't just passively sitting by and allowing harm to happen or watching people suffer. As yoga practitioners, we're called to uh, radically be active against harm. And so just sitting by and being like, yeah, but I'm not harmful, I'm not racist, or this isn't my problem. Um, I live in Europe, I live in Canada, I live in wherever, right? It's, that's not an excuse because it's not limited to the scope of a particular people or a particular um, region. It's actually bringing up a little like a uh, spotlight or microscope for us to see how we actually are oppressors and how we do have these same tendencies within ourselves. And that's hard work because it's ugly. You know, no one wants to look at these ugly things yeah. within themselves or within their society. Yeah. It's painful, right? Because we want to be good. And, and, and we are good. <laughs> think of ourselves as good. You know, and think of ourselves as good. I mean, people generally are really good, you know, but we all have this, this shadow self or this dark side or these negative, ugly things that come up and come out. And if we don't see them and we're not aware of them, then they come out and they become actions that are very harmful for people. And if we can see them and be responsible for them and take responsibility for them, we can start to subdue their power, right? Yep. And make choices from a conscious place instead of just reacting from an unconscious place. So to me, I think that's our, that's our obligation as yoga practitioners, I mean, of any color, of any race, of any region, is to do that deep inner work and really start digging in to what this spiritual practice is supposed to be helping us with, right? Not just doing asanas and making shapes and, you know, holding your breath or whatever it is, you know, it's not just about these, you know, physical feats or trying to create good positive feelings and vibe. It's really about doing some deep inner work and looking at, how we're contributing to the problem and how we can be part of the solution. I think that that's interesting, you know, that that's, um, that we're called to do that by Patanjali, right? To use the, the, the sword of discrimination to determine right action. And one of the, the tools that we have for that is, is our own body. And we can use our own body to to understand how things make us feel and uh, to to observe in ourselves long-rooted habits of preference and so that's for, for me one of the things that i always sort of took from from painting and from yoga was first is like okay this this um uh, Maya Kosha, the, the, the sheath of the body, is this first tool that I have to understand my oh, environment, yeah. you know, and, and how it makes me feel. And, and knowing that it makes me feel a particular way, I can take a particular action. I can even choose to take a different, a different action. And maybe I'm not so um, led deterministically. So... 
you know, looking at a, at a painting, that's, that's what I like to do when I look at a painting is, is, is understand how it makes me feel and what it makes me do in my body. Does it make my eyes go this way? Does it make my mouth do a particular thing? Does it make my, my chest round? Does it make you want to run away? <laughs> Again? Does it make you want to run away? Yeah. Does it make you want to run away? Right. And so art, art does this. And then the, the yo, it's sort of a, you, you sort of often passively understand something with your body. And yoga, you're kind of actively taking on particular body shapes that affect your mind in a, in a particular way. And we do this consciously to feel a particular way. Uh, to for, as a therapy, and I wanted to give you an, an example of this. Uh, I had mentioned to you on the phone the other day uh, 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 an art teacher named, um, excuse me, an artist named uh, Adrian Piper, mm -hmm. who is a, an African American woman. She wrote a, an interesting book called Meta Art: uh, Out of Out of Order, Out of Sight. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we're thinking about metacognition, right? So like, for example, we're zooming in on this phone call. Yeah. Of the zoom. But we can also zoom out. Very nice. So, so um, uh, Ms. Piper does this interesting performance in 1988 called Cornered which is very interesting. She, there's a, an example of it in Chicago, the artist of Chicago, um, where she's, she's cornered herself in, in a room. Okay. And she protected herself and she's on screen. And then she says a number of things that I was going to say we're provocative, but we choose whether they are provocative as an audience. She says, uh, I'm black. And it's interesting because you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily know at first, because in, in like in Louisiana, we might say that she was Creole, you know, like, like Lena Horne. So, and then she says, perhaps you prefer that I, that I would pass and choose to pass as white. Huh. Well, if you prefer, if you have a preference for white, and you think the white is better than black, and if this performance angers you, then I'd like to have a conversation with you about that. Yeah. And so immediately, for you in the audience, you can ask yourself, what is your face doing right now? Yeah. What is your mouth doing right now? What is your body doing right now? And, and how do you feel being confronted with some basic truths and, and a call to not hurt me, please, for telling you these truths? Please, please don't hurt me <laughs> as I tell you these truths. It's, it's amazing. A couple of years later, I was in Korea and I had founded a uh, Marxist feminist performance art group with my friend Kate Hershiser. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> was, uh, Kate is the, the adopted niece of Oral Hershiser, the great pitcher from the LA Dodgers. You probably remember him. Um, Kate later changed her name to Kate Hers. <laughs> Kate Kate hers. So instead of her sizer, she became hers. Yeah, she's nice. Um, <laughs> Kate and I um, noticed we were doing this work that was body centered and, and, and thinking about you know the the political sphere of the streets and and the the how it feels to be in the street. Um, we we kept noticing that every time we got into a taxi that the cab driver without fail would start harassing Kate, sometimes yelling, screaming, angry at Kate. She didn't speak Korean. And it got to the point where she wrote out a, a card 
and she gave the card out to each cab driver that would start yelling at her. The, and the card read in Korean, uh, forgive me, I'm Jamie Gyokwo. I'm adopted Korean and I'm sorry if this insults you. It was out of my control. And so then Kate sent that card to Adrian Piper. She sent her a note and Adrian Piper wrote us back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she said, what, on the, and the postcard that we received in, in Seoul and said, what society is most insulted by are the very tiniest of differences, the tiny differences. So like sound, for example, volume, you know, like when a woman laughs too loud, that all over the, the, the planet, society tries to control women and keep them in control. When women laugh too loud, that's often threatening. Yeah. Or if a, like if a neighbor, if a neighbor is too loud, you know, what, we, what you do, you get you, the anger inside of your body, the hate that you'd feel for that person is like, consumes you and you'll call the police for them. you should have <laughs> compassion for them you should yeah. but you'll send the police after them knowing full well the consequences of sending the police are uh in, are <laughs> there's no boundary at that point anything could happen and you know even even you know death and and so it's interesting, the, the police officer, because they're rightly, they're called, when you, when you see this, that I've, that when they're called peace officers, because mm. that's, that's really what they do. They keep the peace. They like the, the, they the environment. They like the neighborhood quiet because they represent the authority of the majority. Ah. And the majority prefers a quiet population you know, maybe, maybe because they're all, you know, Midwesterners, you know, but they, they like quietness and they maintain quietness. And so the peace officer represents that authority, represents the proclivity of the authority. And at the heart of it, these, these choices are totally arbitrary. These preferences, completely nuts and irrational at a certain, at a certain point when examined. And that's, that's what yoga is for. Yoga looks at these seeds of discrimination, these seeds of, of these stories. Yoga gets to the heart of it and examines why we have a, a raga why we have an aversion and a craving. What is it? Why do we prefer it? What can we do about that now? How do you how do you hold it in your body and then and then release it? Yeah, and the um, the asanas like they kind of serve also as this fertile ground for us to kind of engage with that place where we're uncomfortable, you know. And so then it's like I, I often say, you know, they or I was told once I heard this teaching that. Gandhi said, you know, like there's three ways you can approach a situation where you kind of just like most of us will run away from the thing that's bothering us, like you say. Uh, others will try to conquer that thing, you know, will try to <laughs> by force, you know, by carrying a gun or something like a police officer instill peace upon. And then very few of us will cultivate this communication, like what you were saying with this artist. Right. with air and so i feel like on our sticky mats we often are faced with each one of these positions they're like they're kind of comfort level i mean discomfort levels of where we're at moment to moment yeah. but then we have to translate that off of the mat too you know like that's why i asked you the question about what do we do once we're done you know on our mat is that where it ends and then well what do we do you know how do we relate to our our child or our spouse or you know our our neighbor who doesn't have the same viewpoint as us yeah it's that's i mean that's really the the practice right is 
we have these asanas to observe these tendencies, this, uh, you know, preference, the desire, the aversion, the places where we're uncomfortable in our bodies or in our minds, so that we can then be informed about our own, you know, inadequacies or our own areas where we need to work or growth. We have already started to cultivate a mindfulness and awareness um, of ourselves, you know, even just a little bit. So that when we go into the rest of the day and we're dealing with our spouse or our child or our neighbors or people around us or the media or whatever it is, we have a little bit of insight there. We have a little bit of uh, space that we've created to see, you know, what's going, what's actually going on. Hopefully, if the practice is actually working that way. Um, I think, you know, it, it brings up an interesting uh, difference, you know, I think in the West, we tend to be focused and even like Western religions really focused on judgment. You know, there's a big tendency towards like the judgment day, you know, judgment of people, judgment of right and wrong and good. And and bad. Just and in it, general, that there's like this, you know, beginning oh. and end, these exactly. blinders. Yeah. And so there's this kind of like du duality, this kind of very like, are you with me or not with me? Are you black? Are you white? You know, like there's this binary kind of thinking because of this idea of judgment. Because when you're judging something, you're putting it in its place. You're making it right or wrong, right? It goes into some particular category. And I think the Eastern philosophy, yoga philosophy, talks more about... Keeping in mind that Japan is west of here. <laughs> yeah. Where's the west? But it uh, you know, speaks more to darshan. And even yoga is a darshan. It's a way of seeing, right? Comes from that same root is drishti, to see. And so darshan, the philosophies are called darshan or darshana and this is more about understanding and seeing and perceiving and trying to uh, get into a dialogue with you know seeing hungers and fears and what's driving someone and what's holding someone back and and then um, relating it to your own experience and your own self and then you're in, all of a sudden in relationship with something and you're no longer putting it in its, in its finite category. And it's like, okay, this is right, this is wrong. It's like, no, but why, what's happening? What's going on? What's the process behind this? What, what's the feeling? What's the sensation? What's, you know, driving this person or what's driving myself, right? And you become then in relationship with that thing. And I think that slight difference of changing from like knowing and judging to being curious and seeing trying to really see and understand and perceive something shifts like you're saying that the direction of the conversation right it shifts the direction of your mind to one that's open and receptive uh, versus one that's more rigid and directive you know yeah. And I think that's a subtle um, shift that is helpful. And the yoga practice, I think, cultivates that shift within us as we start to get a little bit more curious about, you know, well, why is this hard for me? And why do I feel this here when I do this, but I don't feel it when I do that other thing, right? What, what is it in this posture that makes me want to throw up? You know, we start to ask interesting questions. And hopefully the questions that originally start with like the postures or asanas go deeper eventually. You know, why is it that when I see this person, I want to throw up? I mean, you know. <laughs> because I was married to them. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a, there's, you know, you start to explore like what's really going on and, and it, that that person's problem or is this my problem? Because it's always your own problem. It's never that other person's problem, right?
Yeah, so, that, that's oh. really, I mean, what you just said is kind of interesting because it, it brings to mind what has been on my mind this morning based on yesterday. And, and, and I'm going to go off the, I mean, we don't even need these things. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, so in Charlottesville, you may know a little bit about our fair town there sure. was a debate about you know these statues which right. are symbols icons you know they're they're kind of like these myth but unlike indian statues which are often gods they're humans you know so they're fallible and they carry all of this weight and all of this baggage with it i mean we even in our own ashtanga yoga practice have some of these icons that you know carry a lot of weight and things too so um but how do we like like do so i there's one in particular in town there it's like a cowering sacagawea with you know lewis and clark with guns you know they're all like this and and i'm just it drives me crazy yeah. like i i literally look at that thing but it it took like 10 times i passed it i never even noticed it you know like i just i was totally oblivious Mm -hmm. And now I'm noticing this and, and have this revulsion, you know, this compel, but at the same time, like, like you're saying, Harmony, do I need to go and try to like, find out why these, you know, Jim Crow people really want to keep that statue there, you know, like, and be honest about that. Like, where do I, like, and you how, know, how oh. they get the, the, how they get it made in the first place. I mean, how did a statue of Jefferson Davis get made? There was a yep. serious policy discussion and then somebody had to get, you know, the funds together legislatively to put that together. And that, that's a, that's a, that's a, there, there are no statues of, of um, Benedict Arnold. You know, it's like, I don't even know, I don't even know where to start with that. Yeah. So, but with relating to art, it, it is often it's, uh -huh. um, you know, the like practice of history. Yeah, what, yeah. <laughs> it, it seems. It, it's incredible. an excellent point. Um, there's a number of of paintings that have been uh, stabbed uh, <laughs> for the same reason. Uh, the um, uh, Velasquez is painting. Uh, oh, I forget the name of it, but it's a woman looking in a mirror and uh, a woman, uh, very angry, stabbed it because it's just, it represents the male gaze. It represents, you know, millennia of, of generations of men looking at women as objects to be, to be used for their pleasure. And it's that kind of Orientalism of of using of using the objects of other cultures for your own pleasure as a continuation, and so all of that's all of that's been disrupted by modernism. Right. So in 1880 and 1890, people said, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna do that anymore. We're gonna make art for for people, and so you get all of these these square shapes, color fields, pure color that you interact with. And, and so Piet Mondrian, uh, Matisse, all of these people are, are trying to make a, a, a very, very socialist painting is what abstract painting is. It's very socialist. You don't have to know anything. All you have to do is look at it. Mm. But then what do you do with the, the, the hundreds and thousands of these, these exquisite objects that are left? You know, so at some point it's like, well, I'm gonna stab it. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, but well, you know, you have like, you, you have the Mysore, you know, Mahisarasura. And, and they they erect a demon god, you know, and they're yeah. like in the name a city after it, and so there's like that place where I think you can maybe understand a bigger picture, recognizing that you know like it was a bad I don't know, 
I'm not good at that place. I'm usually good at boxing things in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, I mean, it's a difficult place to sit because it's uncomfortable because there's no, there's no definitive right action to take necessarily. It's sometimes there is. Sometimes there is, and sometimes it's <laughs> obvious, and sometimes it's, it's a. Uh, sometimes it becomes apparent, also, right? But in the meantime, there's sort of a a place where you're questioning and and the answers might not exactly be right there really immediately and and you know something like this statue it's it's interesting to ask yourself those questions like why didn't i notice it before why wasn't i offended by it before yeah. like wow that's kind of really awful right yeah <laughs> You know, and then to do that introspection and be like, well, I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm offended by it now. So <laughs> um, that's progress, right? That means more awareness has come up. Um, but like, there's all kinds of things, but it's, it's not to, it's not to, you know, beat yourself up over. It's not to, to, you know, be harsh with yourself because like, we all have blind spots. We have things that we don't know that we don't know. And areas of our mind, of our, our awareness, of our idea of self and what includes our self and the boundaries around our self. And we don't, we're not aware of them. We don't necessarily see them. They're just blind because they've just been there. They've been there, you know, since before we could think conscious thoughts. So it's really buried deep, deep, deep in our programming, deep in our unconscious mind. And when these types of, you know, this is the largest civil rights movement of history, you know, come up and start to create more awareness, start to bring this unconscious stuff to the surface. Um, it's, it's really helpful, you know, it's helpful for our own spiritual evolution. It's helpful for our growth and we should be very thankful and grateful to have this light all of a sudden shining on all these hidden areas of our ourselves as as white people that are were before very repressed and suppressed and really like built into our programming and all of a sudden now we're questioning and and seeing ourselves as white i mean you know that's it's interesting this we talked because, a little bit on on our podcast yeah. that we did yesterday that's coming out on Sunday about this idea of whiteness. And, you know, in the news, whenever a black person goes into a store and does something terrible, it's like a black male, you know, goes in and robs a store or something. There's always this, an Asian male or a an Asian, you know, a negative. negative connotation put to a color or an ethnicity. But they don't ever say like a white male goes in and robs a store. They just said a male. <laughs> right? Or a male wins the lottery. Local oh, male. That's a white guy. Right. Mm. So it's it's interesting to all of a sudden shine that light on your own prejudice or your own bias towards yourself, towards you, what your preference is, when maybe you didn't even know it was a preference or a bias. Yeah. And it's I mean it's not. I, I use the word interesting because it's also painful because we, when you all of a sudden see something that you didn't see before, it can be quite uh, shocking. shocking. Like <laughs> it shakes you, right? It shakes you to the core, I hope. And, and, but that's a good thing. It's a really good place to be because that's where change happens and not just internal change for yourself, but like societal change. And that's, so encouraging that people are really like tuning in and waking up and and mm. getting shaken you know in so many different ways one thing people may not understand is uh that within art structures uh, museums can only afford to share uh two percent of their collection at any time and so like the metropolitan uh what's the museum there in charlottesville uh, there's the Freuling, but the DC like, is really close. So all the Smithsonian stuff and the National the Freuling, Gallery. Is there. The Freuling, for example, um, or the <laughs> National Gallery, certainly in Washington, they're only they only have two percent of their collection on display, and the vast majority is unpopular work 
uh, that is now uh, in a storehouse someplace because it doesn't suit the the taste of the times. That's where your stuff goes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Until a couple of decades from now. Oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> yeah, that's where my stuff is, It's John. in deep, deep storage. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's where it is. It's kind of a blind spot for uh, <laughs> the National Gallery, actually. <laughs> Oh, yeah. He hit his pain point, you know. Oh, his psoas. Yeah. His, deep, his, his deep repressed oh, tension. Man. Yeah. That's interesting, actually, that connection between uh, the repressed emotions and repressed things and, and pains in the body. And, oh, yeah. and as things come to your mind, how your body experiences um, emotions or you know repressed ideas, beliefs, thoughts, or just a general anxiety, stress, tension, empathy. Uh, the body, you know, feels it, right? I mean, yeah. so bad, I mean, so it I, like contracts. You feel pain. Well, harmony. I I drove by a few years ago. People dressed like us. Um, but they were in front of this church and they were just like this. Mm -hmm. And you could tell just by their posturing that they were downtrodden and, and probably likely homeless. So it was like this, you know, just this opening up sometimes, you know, and posturing, it can work the other way, possibly, where you actually are becoming receptive, like a radar, you know, like where you're tuning in to more things ideally um, yeah it's kind and of you a, feel it when you are um when you have this emotion or this this stress you know if you're going through stressful times you feel your body closing down you feel this contraction this this sense of like i need to hide my heart or whatever it is you know mm. i need to protect myself um even if it's not like a conscious thought you're not like uh i need to hide my heart and protect myself it's just the body's reaction is this inflammation is to carry this tension this stress and the practice is so therapeutic that way because it helps you to release it and keeps you open and receptive to things you know because if you have no way to release that energy if you have no way to open up your chest when everything in your patterning is trying to close it, then how are you going to reverse that, that um, tendency in your body or in your mind, right? It's just going to become more of a pattern. And so, you know, keeping the practice going, um, especially during times of stress, is so important, like you're saying, because it keeps you open, it keeps you receptive, it keeps these emotions and thoughts and feelings and everything moving. And it gives you an outlet to process this stuff, which is, I mean, more than what most people have, you know, sometimes maybe, you know, it's done through running or shaking or dancing, but, you know, the yoga is really like a science with it. And it, it goes through all the different parts of the body, all the different areas, and like does it kind of systematically, which is really particularly I, I feel like backbending is a position of vulnerability, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that story that Sharat has told where he was doing kapatasana with the lions around him. Okay. And I'm thinking in my mind how like vulnerable he, you know, like how you have to be in this mindset where you're just totally vulnerable yeah. with roaring lions around you. And also as a metaphor, like what that means. And if, you know, God knows if I could get my, I have a couple of cousins that I'd love to get to do backbending. <laughs> Maybe that might help them like tune into what's going on in the world. Um, yeah. but, uh, <clears throat> you're describing um, the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. Um, I come from a, uh, a competing and superior institution at Stanford University. Nobody joked, nobody laughed at that. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, um, we, we did a study at Stanford with the organization that uh, is associated with the 
the Contemplative Sciences Center, yeah. uh, the Pure Edge Foundation, and uh, looked at a lot of, um, looked at the effect of, of mindfulness on kids. And um, so we did a lot of work there in this four year longitudinal study on, on the brain, on the body and the endocrine system. And it was uh, my pleasure to kind of, you know, soak up little pieces of jungle doctor knowledge uh, about, about the brain, about the nervous system. And, and so it was interesting always to kind of use it as an overlay to examine what was talked about with Patanjali or talked about with our yoga uh, masters that we know, uh, Paramaguru or, or Richard Freeman. Yeah. So Richard Freeman always talked about this, this pranic, uh, aponic pattern, you know, the, the Shiva and the Shakti, the kind of aponic chronic trying to think of the opposite while we're doing each of these things you know are we you know thinking about these at the, the same time and then seeing how in neuroscience that all these things could be identified you know like the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system that you know when we're when we're afraid and frightened and there's a threat in our environment and we're so used to that you know, if, if, you, if you believe in evolution, then, you know, from you know, a million odd years, you know, you've got to ask, you know, if for a million odd years, uh, people, you know, um, were consciously threatened by their environment and used to taking an aponic turtle shell to yeah. protect themselves from any kind of threat that might be approaching at any time. And and had to be so careful about when they could express themselves, when they could open up and feel joyous. Mm -hmm. And then enter this, this soft parasympathetic nervous system, this space. And it has an exact correlation in, in the brain. So like, you know, when we emit, um, we emit energy whenever we do anything in our, in our brain. It's called a brain wave. And so the brainwave changes as we, as we um, do different activities. You know, so when we're solving problems like threats in our environment, you know, then, then we have a very short brainwave, this beta wave, as we're, as we're doing executive function. You know, you're, um, you're on your phone and, and, or you're, you're solving problems, you're on your computer and you're taking a panic state and you're solving problems the whole time. And then there's a, there's a response in the body. Cortisol, the stress hormone, builds up in the body. And it has to be released or... When, when you made this face as a kid, John, what did your grandmother tell you? Uh, <laughs> my grandmother, I, yeah, I didn't really have too many times with her, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> What she, that's a sad story. What she probably said, John, was if you keep making that face, it'll stay that it'll way. Stay that way, yeah. Yeah, and that's the same way when, when our, when our, your mother told you that. That's nice. When, when we hold this, this shape, you know, the, the nerves go out into our body and they contract these muscles, right? And so when we hold the shape for a long period of time, we hold the habit. And it might be a cultural habit that we've learned, but it might be something that we learned just from our own, our own story. We hold this, the muscle holds, just like in our face, it stays that way. Yeah. Again, yoga is this radical intervention where we're gonna make ourselves open our body and make ourselves go into the, a parasympathetic or prana pattern and then there's a there's a simultaneous change in the brain where the brain goes from this beta wave this executive function to a slower wave and it's literal and physical you know it's not fruity it's not just you know it's california you know it's and it's, there's that there's that verse too you know the we talk about any pratipaksha bhavanam like when your mind is 
fixed on one thing, do the opposite, you know? So it's like constantly you're supposed to be like, but then that doesn't also mean maybe sleeping in a back bend because that's also traumatizing. <laughs> <laughs> you can yeah. get stuck that way too. <laughs> <laughs> But it was interesting when I first saw you, you know, when I first saw you in New York, we were we were roommates there. It was I you could see it all over you that you were a relaxed dude, that you were in a kind of softer state all the time, much softer than than I am. I'm a little, you know, hot wired. But uh you were just like sitting. And like <laughs> Look at just looking at you like, oh, that guy's a backbender for sure. That guy can go into a backbend. <laughs> it. It's written all over you. Um, all right, uh, let's let's get back on to some more um, positive stuff, if that's all right with you guys. Um, so, how do we? Um, first off, this is kind of a fun one. What are your favorite postures or practices that you like to do to restore? Oh, I like the I like uh, the wide pigeon postures. Those are some of my favorite. Um, Supta Virasana. Okay. Uh, nice psoas stretch, quad stretch. Um, legs up the wall. Yeah. A wide Baddha Konasana. Those are all my my go tos. My very favorites. How did you go into the lightness and I went into the darkness? Like I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sun change. Well, I'll be all right. The sun moves. I'll be all right. In the I'm kind of blinded. Don't, you're blinded. Yeah. Um, there we go. There we go. There we go. Yeah, there you go. Right, much better. We'll switch sides. <laughs> Clips. <laughs> That's what. It's too upsetting to the viewers at home. Yeah, just switch. <laughs> Got to get their money's worth. <laughs> we'll start dancing next. <laughs> What about you? What do you like? I just like painting. Yeah. <laughs> painting makes me feel good. I go in there. How long do you do that in stretches? How long of stretches do you do that for? Painting? Yeah. yeah. I'll do, I'd like, to, I'd like to do three sessions for an hour a day. But I normally just do about two sessions for about an hour a day. I go down there and I listen to my, my modal jazz records from the 50s and you know, have a nice time, get into a nice space. When I paint, I get into this mode where I want to just, I, I, I like, we'll do it for 12 hours and I won't eat or anything. I just like totally get absorbed into this place where I'm just like, I gotta, I gotta just keep going, you know, yeah. but I, I don't do it. And my, my practice really stinks. So I do it so infrequently. Like it's like once every four years or something, I'll go through this, like, Oh, I really want to make this piece of art because something came into my head and then it's just this <clears throat> binge. Yeah. Were you playing guitar earlier when we were? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so all those things do the same thing to the brain as putting your legs up the wall or, or doing Vipassana. They all, you know, drop down the brain wave and they all bring us into a parasympathetic place where we feel contemplative and rested and then we can go back to work having rested and it's it's nice but um and this it's this is indifferent it's actually not dissimilar from yoga at all it's you know, it all you just you have to identify and find things in your life that do that and yoga is very efficient in that way but anything can work and this is kind of a question that I had about um, that place where we want our, at least my tendency is to, so I guess I'm wrestling with absorption in that thing as being potential for yoga, but also in sectioning off is also not yoga. For example, like I wrote you this question about how universities often, I feel like they have the gym space there. That's where you work out. And then, you know, the classroom space is where you work in. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're not supposed to mix those two. Wow. Um, <clears throat> but I feel like sometimes in our uh, practices, like for me, a yoga practice is using like both of those things, you know. Mm -hmm. and, yet, and yet we are also like wanting to go to this place of 
absorption, you know, just totally submerged into that thing. Yeah. That love. Yeah, the concentration on one point, right? That leads to um, samadhi. I think it's helpful to uh, to have a little bit of both, to be honest. I think the the asana, like you say, the working out to work in is 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 really beneficial. But I think it's also beneficial to have like a little bit of a seated practice of of mindfulness or you know breath awareness, anapana meditation or vipassana meditation or even just like a mantra or japa or whatever it is that that lets the body be still and allows the mind to become very focused, I think is helpful because it, um, I don't know, you see your mind differently then, you know, you see its patterns come up more. Ac- story. Yeah, acutely. And you can really witness what's going on, like how it moves, how it jumps, whether it's restless, whether it's, it's calm and you can see these, the internal uh, struggles a little bit more clearly rather than sometimes I think with the asana, it's good, it's helpful, it's a great starting point to like start pulling the mind in and focusing on breath, on bandha, on posture. Um, But still you're moving the body and still you're controlling the breath. And so the brain is very active, right? And, and it's doing something and something happens when you stop doing things, when you just let stuff come to the surface. Hmm. And that's, that's when the tears come. Yeah. It's like when you stop agitating the water and see what happens, see where things settle or see what arises. I think it's, it's really informative and also very good for stress reduction. <laughs> Yeah, see, go ahead, Russell. I just like to stuff that stuff down <laughs> as and just not, you yeah. Know, just well, that's 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 the problem with a lot of men. I feel like is honestly like we, you know, you're not supposed to talk about that. You're not supposed to express a lot of those things that have. So then we, uh, many of us, must you know, like we vent it and very unhealthy ways (laughs) you know like we don't deal with it or process it in a way that's that's healthy for us and for others i think um uh, i want to know it sounds like you guys have really been fortunate to study with lots of masters and i want to know um a look and and now you have your little guru there in the house (laughs) (laughs) yeah our little tyrant (laughs) (laughs) Uh, training you to be warriors. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you could talk a little bit about some, some of the, the things you're grateful f- for from learning from them and any wisdom that you might share with us about that process. Wow. Um, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, we talk about this sometimes. I think what you learn from uh, people, teachers, mentors um, who are really steeped in a deep spiritual practice or in in yoga meditation um, isn't necessarily something you can put into words it's not something that they've said necessarily or specifically uh, spoken to you I mean sometimes it is you know um, one master teacher that I studied a lot with you know we always would emphasize sincerity over seriousness. So like, you know, sometimes there's little little gems of, you know, token words or phrases that you kind of remember. But um, I think what you really get is that transmission that you you feel their vibration, you feel their energy. And because humans uh, are, Um, adaptable adaptable and and mirror what's around them and in their environment we start to take on the same qualities as those things Um, that's why our mothers always told us be careful who your friends are right Mm -hmm. because you start to be like your friends we're soft we have soft bodies yeah (laughs) and minds i mean we're very it's very moldable (laughs) so 
So I think that's the real, um, what I'm really grateful for is just having that experience and time to be around people that are, uh, you know, deeply spiritual and have had very deep experiences that way. And, you know, it's not necessarily limited to gurus or, or, you know, people of authority. I mean, even just, you know, friends or senior teachers, I know that, or, you know, not necessarily even that senior, <laughs> you know, just people that, that I think have really been aware and been through something and experienced something, it changes their vibration and it changes how they, they experience the world and being around that you feel it, you, it changes you. And that's, I think, really valuable. What I'm really grateful for is having, I mean, being surrounded by people that are seekers. That's a, an amazing boon in life, right? To have a community of practitioners and people that are all trying to uh, connect with a higher self, with God or consciousness or a deeper reality. And I mean, that's a not, people don't have that. That's not normal. I mean, it's normal for us cause, because well, how we do you have balance, it. How do, you, how do you balance that with, um, you know, being a, a, fam, a householder and, you know, you work a lot. I, I'm always I impressed by like, <laughs> I mean, it's like, you're, you know, and you're, it's like this constant. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so I also acknowledge that as like really being this compassionate, like caring individual who's actually going, you know, practicing what she preaches you know and it's it's really amazing to see that so but I want to know your secrets <laughs> I, I try to practice what I preach <laughs> not always successful um I mean you know it's it's challenging I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you otherwise it's it's a real balancing act between you know, having time to spend with your child. And we've been homeschooling for the last three months, which is like a whole other thing. Yeah. And then teaching and doing like all of the other administrative technological stuff. And oh. um, I think I think part of uh, finding that balance is, wow, we're really like, we need to shift again. <laughs> <laughs> We're just going to confuse people. <laughs> you have to stop the sun in the sky. You I know. know. It's, <laughs> it was like, the perfect uh, in the Mahabharata. level before. Now it's a little <laughs> right. But now you see our, our light and our shadow side. So it's yeah. more it's balanced. It's metaphorical. Um, <laughs> but I think one of the key things is to uh, focus on what's in front of you. You know? And... Yeah maybe ask yourself like what do i need to do now mm. you know and organization's helpful like <laughs> try to be organized try to set out your priorities what are the yeah. most important things i need to do or get done today and realize you're probably not going to be able to accomplish them all but you make know a list. <laughs> make a list yeah i have all kinds of lists um <laughs> but then also um you know make time for yourself like you and this is, this is probably, you know, to be honest, my biggest struggle is, is carving that time out. It's really hard when you're busy and you have people depending on you and yeah. a lot of stuff going on. You need to really create that space in your day for you, you to do your thing so that you can be effective. Yeah. And if you don't have that space in your day, um, you know, it's more difficult. When I was teaching uh, classroom teachers around the country how to find some, uh, like a well of resilience and, and trying to help them with, with stress reduction, that's often the biggest, hardest mitigating factor is time. And, and the privilege that comes with time. You know, I, I've, I'm a, you know, that I just said that I had two hours that, a day and I had to paint. It was like, I was like, suddenly overwhelmed with, sh with like white privilege, shame, 
and like, ah, uh, yeah, okay. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, underemployed. So that's, <laughs> uh, that's all right. Um, and I, but so working with, with school teachers, you know, the, um, what we discovered in, in trying to offer them service is, is that at looking at like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, the biggest thing they need is union representation. Uh, but they're, the thing that, that hurts them the most is stress. And so anything that we could do to help them with stress would, would be that thing. And so always when you're most stressed is the time you don't have, that you, you don't think about doing anything about it. Yeah. That's when you really need it. And so I would, I would talk to them about finding these transitions in your day. And so, for example, when you drive to, to work, you've got, and you park the car, you've got now 60 seconds where you could sit and, and breathe into the top of your chest. Not listen to the radio, not take your phone, not do your thing, you know, and then go into your place of work, you know. And so there, maybe even like before the Zoom call, you know, you're playing guitar, it was, it was lovely. You can also just take a moment before the next activity. And it's like, I'm just gonna, I need to balance and center myself for 30 seconds. And then go do that thing. You know, instead of like what I do, where I go to my phone and I look at like the political situation. <laughs> like, okay, that still sucks. And then go do the thing that you're gonna do. But you know, remembering in that moment, right before that next thing that, oh, I need to, I need to center and balance myself. And, and that notion is surprisingly not pervasive in our, in our culture. You know, that, that we should take moments to center ourselves before doing the next thing even though the model of that in sports is, is, you know, wide and you know, every, every basketball player before taking a free throw centers themselves yeah. for a moment, takes a breath. And then shoots every single time. Is that, this is a conjecture. Do you think this is maybe part of the, positioning of the practice where we return to the zero position, summest at the heat, you know, just to kind of be like, okay, here we are again, you know, and then yeah. when we go launch into the next, oh, got to go back to center myself, you know, and it sets us up in this whole loop. Yeah, I like to, I often describe summest at the like that uh, as like the reset, you know, like you do a thing and then it's like you wipe, wipe it, the screen clean or like with the, uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhists, how they make the the beautiful mandalas out of sand and then they yeah. wipe it away, right? It's, I feel like Samastitihi is a bit like that. It's like this. Okay, yeah, that's and I feel like yeah, the zero that's, position. That's the problem, you know. In reality, is we're grasping onto this icon or this, you know, idea, and that's where all of our issues are like, Arr, you know. But yeah. in, you know, you have to remove that. Yes, exactly. Sometimes it's not really about doing more or doing uh, a specific thing. Sometimes it's about letting go yeah. and letting go of your need to be the center of attention all the time, right? Letting go of your need to be the voice that's being heard, letting go of your uh, opinion and ideas, right? Like you can't really be open and receptive unless you're able to release and i think that's also the practice of parig of aparigraha right this hanging on this holding yeah i mean it's called hoarding but it's also just holding on to things and parigraha is the open hand and so when we have parigraha we have an open hand what's an open hand it's a blessing it's offering it's receiving it's it's this um metaphor for for being in relationship, right? Not uh, constricting and being closed. 
And uh, to that end, um, I think what we're going to do is open the platform so that other people can write in on chat. So um, if someone is available, Lindsay or Anna, to be able to open the chat room, and I'll take questions from you guys, because in these times, um, the community is a little bit less. And it's nice to communicate with as many of you as we can. And then hopefully Russell and, I, and Harmony and I will just call each other later and just answer all of these questions <laughs> one by <laughs> one. It'll be a 12 hour phone call. <laughs> yeah, we have like a, like a whole little mini series. <laughs> yeah, we'll sit at the pool somewhere, you know, or the nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right, um, let's have a look, see, and see if anyone has uh, written any chat questions. Um, if not, then uh, while we're waiting, um, do you think Ashtanga can help teenagers who are struggling with uh, addictive behaviors such as alcohol and smoking or vaping or any of these other things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yoga is helpful for the the human to deal with addiction one of the biggest problems you have with addiction is the change in brain disposition which is to say the shape of the brain and so if you look at an mri of uh, someone on cocaine uh, or heroin or sugar they all are very similar in that their ability to receive, and that's true about sugar. <laughs> it is. <laughs> that their ability to receive dopamine is severely reduced. Uh, they, they, the, the person who is addicted cannot receive dopamine because the, the, of the shape of the, of the brain is so changed. Yeah. And so, so much work, and, they, and People talked about this with Robert Downey Jr. quite a bit. It was the first time I encountered the idea that the shape of his brain was so changed by the disease that he couldn't see and feel a reward. And so he couldn't be rewarded by his own work without the drug, whether it was sugar or heroin or cocaine. And so finding a, a way with your yoga practice to heal your, your receptors and to feel rewarded again takes a long, long ass time. Yeah. And that's, and Patanjali makes that real clear. That it's going to take long, a long period of sustained practice to feel that again. And, you know, sometimes, um, but it does, it does change, you know, so like the, the amygdala, the fight or flight response to the brain, that has been demonstrated to change shape with mindfulness practice. And there's a lovely study done on nuns and comparing them to football players. And I love football, but okay. So, and I played football in, in high school and had to make that transition from loving violence to being able to, to be contemplative in the same way that that happened. So the, one of the things they, they, they found in this study was that in our human species from the, they were looking at football players because of the CTE that you may have heard about. Uh, football players have the uh, largest, thickest amygdala in the, the human species. Because the amygdala, when it responds to circulation and to stimulation, it'll grow to, yeah. to to endure its environment, to manage its environment. And so the amygdala uh, changes shape, it gets thicker, and they become inured to violence, and maybe even like violence more. And because that's, the, that's their job, their profession is, is violence, is a profession. Okay. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the, the nun who spent, you know, you know, 30, 40 years in uh, devotional practices that, you know, drop that brainwave down, that replace cortisol with the opposite hormone, oxytocin. And so there's a change in the stress hormone in the body. 
and then the disposition of the amygdala starts to change. So it becomes instead of thick, they say thin, and so it thins. And it was discovered that um, the nuns in, in this study had the thinnest amygdala that had been observed in the human species, which meant that there was enormous, there had been enormous change because it was so consistent. There had been enormous change in, in the actual physical shape of the brain. Yeah. Which can, which can, you know, depending on how we bathe our mind, bathe our brain, can, can fundamentally change our personality. Yeah. But like you said, just often takes a little bit of time to get there. It's not, not a practice. weekend workshop, unfortunately. <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, but I'll tell you what, was, a weekend workshop with Richard Freeman changed my life. <laughs> that was probable. And you're cured. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's that thing about, about, um, I'm going to get myself into trouble, but it's that thing about wokeness. You know, the, you get woke to something, but then suddenly you realize you're not woke to something else. And so constantly, you're constantly reopening and reexamining layers of, of bias and, yeah. and things that you just prefer or don't prefer. How do you uh, adapt a practice to age, like as we age? Very delicately. <laughs> But, but like serious, be serious about it because yeah. it hurts. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to be, I think you have to just be really, you know, realistic. And for, for like, you know, if you started practicing when you're really young, your body fe felt very different um, or feels very different when you're young and you can kind of be a little bit cruel to it and it, it responds. And um and I think as you get older, you have to practice with a lot more compassion and a lot more awareness and a lot more listening and really paying attention to what's happening that day because it changes too, you know? I think, um, you know, some days that you're more inflamed, there's more inflammation, other days less. Some days like your joints are really sore. I mean, which is again, a symptom of inflammation and other days not. And it's not exactly your body doesn't recover as quickly. So I think you have to um, yeah, be gentle. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's interesting um, on the chat, Kali asks a, a question that's apropos, mm -hmm. is that you develop a, a 30 year yoga practice yeah. and there are all these fruits, you know, the, 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 the boons of the devas that distract us from moksha. And we get attached to getting the, our foot behind our head. And we also, we use it as a status symbol in society that I can put my foot behind my head and other people can't. And look how, look how deep it can go. Look, look there's my foot right there. You know? <laughs> and I can wrap that around. And it's the same way with... Uh, you're like, not showing it off. <laughs> <laughs> you're praying that you're done. <laughs> right. <laughs> constant prayer and it's the same way she asked about the fruits of painting and, and not being attached to the fruits of your labor and, and not being attached to the the paintings the paintings are a constant source of frustration <laughs> but you you get attached to them and it's like you know and you you want to make better and better paintings when in fact you're always there for the process you yeah. were there because it made you feel good and it helped you to understand yourself and understand you know, why you do the things that you do. And, and, but it's, it's so natural. You, you, you work for the sake of work. In the Bhagavad Gita teaches us that, that you know, Krishna, you, you work for the sake of work. And that is, is helpful to us when we're in crisis. Just work for the sake of work and make an art out of work. And then, you know, you, you make a living and you get nice furniture and then you're, you, know, you get real attached to it. It's like, I like my furniture now. And uh, one more real quick one, guys. Yeah. And, it, and it's because this one has kind of been on a theme going through for many things. Uh, 
someone asked about this impulse to to dominate uh, you mentioned you know like or it's it can subdue this impulse to dominate and um i just want to inter interject that like what i've been discussing in the in the this series is this tendency for like the lead class to like help us let go and the Mysore style class to kind of like frame, reframe, you know, like it can be that place where we like, like Russell and I were talking, you know, we are reframing that. Um, but it seems like people don't like that lead class so much. <laughs> so I find um, that the lead class can be that place where you let go and you just like, yeah. you know, become that one with your friends as well as the, you know, the, the engineer of the train, so to speak. Yeah. But um, what are your thoughts on that as far as a pra what are some practical means or do you agree with that, that you can use to help that um, want it, desire to kind of <clears throat> control? Yeah, because I mean, we have a desire to dominate our own bodies too, right? Our own, our own selves as well. And how do you, this is the fight, right? How do we we find a compassionate place to work with the tool that we've been given, um, you know, without fighting, fighting it or harming it even, yeah. right? Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily think that the lead class or the Mysore class, I think both can be used as like a way to check out. I think you can kind of mm. not do the work in both. You can kind of just like, zone out and like in a lead class you're just listening and doing what you're told and like entering this you know program and yeah. like just kind of mechanically going through the practice and i think in a mysore class you can kind of also do that you can also just be like yeah i'm just gonna like you know you're not really like working yourself okay. or working with what's there what's present for you what's coming up you're just sort of you know thinking about what you want for lunch and <laughs> or whatever right um <laughs> And, and vice versa as well. Sometimes the, like you say, the primary series class can also be a very informative experience where you're seeing like this frustration of like, it's too slow, it's too fast. It's right. Like you see all yeah. these preferences coming up and you're really like having to have this awareness of them and surrender and let go and be like, okay, I'm, you know, I've committed to being here and doing this thing. So I need to <laughs> do it. Um, and then also Mysore can be like that too, right? Where you really have a lot coming up and you're really working with it and seeing it and being present for it. So, I mean, all of these different tools, you know, it's the same with meditation. You can sit there and learn to sleep sitting up and not really be, you know, aware and, and engaged uh -huh. and active. Wow. Or you can really like try to be attentive and keep the mind focused on one object or the breath. So it's, inherently there's nothing like good or bad about anything or or you know as far as like spiritual practice goes or as far as these tools go it's really like how we're using them and how they're working for us and and some days you know things don't work as well and that's okay too yeah well those <laughs> yeah. are the dangers right like dullness and agitation yeah and so, like they can come from a seated practice or a a moving practice and they're going to strike and you have to yeah. constantly be, be like two you know like two reins just kind of steering yourself oh i'm getting dull now <laughs> I'm yeah. now. oh i've got to add more mental activity you know and it's like ah. yeah. <laughs> yeah that's i mean and that's the yoga right is how do you take these opposites and hold them in balance and hold them together and 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 put them in relationship with each other yeah. Uh, so they become one. So it becomes one thing instead of two things. And that's really the process of yoga. And it's all these other things that, you know, tendencies in us, like our ego, our attachment, our preferences, our aversion, our, um, you know, illusion about ourselves, our stories, like all these other things that are obstacles to really like being present and doing that work of, of staying on the middle path in a way, right? Like, yeah holding the two things in balance and and that's also not a static position it's also dynamic right yeah you, there was also back to the also the point about uh, aging is yeah. a, one of the the hardest 
things for me to, to have had to endure with yoga practice is, is the shame and humiliation of not being able to perform at 100%. And you see a lot of athletes, they'll, they'll do that. They'll say, you know, I, I don't want to play if I can't play at the highest championship level. Yeah. They retire. And I wish I had retired. You know? <laughs> uh, because, it, you know, I go into that class now and I've got some disc herniation and I'm struggling and I can't perform the way that I used to. And when I used to practice 20 years ago, you know, I, you'd enter a, a flow state, this mm -hmm. kind of golden flow of movement and breath and everything is just this perfect admixture. And it, I, because I was working so hard and I was working so intently in, into this thing, and I can't work that hard anymore at all. And so I don't, enter that space mm -hmm. and it's really deeply humiliating and frustrating <laughs> and going on tour now is an exercise in acceptance of humiliation which is great <laughs> that's that's a great thing to do and it's a great practice and it's actually a better practice Thank you, Melissa. And <laughs> Surrender. It's, a, it's, a, it's a better practice than than, necess, than just maybe entering flow. You know, it's it's a, because it's more it's really real yeah. about, about being able to then interact with other people and and not uh, you know yeah. dom, dominate them at yeah. the pool with how many <laughs> postures you got. <laughs> yeah, it informs your compassion and it also uh, it's a very visceral experience of non-attachment, right? Like that, that everything's in flux, everything's coming and going. And so not to hang on to these, these, uh, little gems that we love about ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it's been so nice. I, I, I really do. Uh, We're not going to stop now. <laughs> Larry, stop Larry, know, Larry yeah. and Tippy are, they're our, they're our age gurus. Larry <laughs> and know. Tippy. Yeah. <laughs> We're learning from them. You all need to give up. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> all right, everyone. Um, it was it was super nice to have you, and thank you so much to Harmony and Russell. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay normally finishes this thing up. She's, She's going to wrap it up for us. Okay. There you go. And I just want to say thank you so much to John and Harmony and Russell for sharing your insights and your perspective today. Um, I want to remind everyone that we are encouraging donations to directrelief.org. And we also strongly encourage you to visit the Contemplative Sciences Center website where you can learn more about our work. Um, and if you're able to consider giving a gift there as well um, to support our work so that we can continue to offer programs like these today. So be sure that you join us next week for our conversation with Hamish Hendry. And we are excited to see you again then. Thank you so much.